All right, well, that wasted 12 minutes. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Uh, let me see. Oh, I need to catch your call. Be back. Yeah, I can't hear you, Barry. You, you're on mute. Did you did you realize it had created a passcode for you on this session? This is the first time it's done that, and I've done no config changes. So I yeah, passcode little h capital U E. I know, I see that. You can see it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it just completely threw me because <laughs> passcode what? <laughs> Never done this to me before. I don't know. I didn't um, did you know that uh, Zoom did a a major upgrade to the uh, client this past week or two? Um, it's the the client ID is I think five dot fourteen something now. I wonder if that's a feature change. Um, if you didn't intentionally do it, it could be an automated feature change, where you have to go back and expressly take out the password that it generated at, uh, for you. you. You have to you have to go to the Zoom website to do that, I think. Well, too bad. That means that nobody who isn't paying attention here who's using sort of remembered uh, value is gonna hit that passcode requirement and get stuck and not know where to find, you know. <laughs> yeah, to I fix. think Zoom's uh adoption is going to go down severely if this is actually the case yeah i mean we could research i tell you what we I, could, I got we could research to find out if they intentionally did that and didn't announce it <laughs> <clears throat> all i did was i got on early i was like four minutes early so i stopped the recording that's it i didn't stop the session at all so i restarted again the recording right around eight o'clock and then there's this timer in the upper right where you can drop it down and say, show remaining time in meeting or show how long the meeting has been going. So I went there and it said, schedule meeting is over. Did you ever stop yesterday's meeting? Oh yeah, absolutely. In okay. fact, it's uh, uploading right now. Um, because, I mean, I know that I installed the latest client just in a few days ago. And the latest client has a bunch of features in it that are new. For example, if you bring up the chat window, you'll see the bottom of the chat window has a bunch of little icons. You can now do formatting. Um, you can take a screenshot. You can put in a file. Uh, you can put in an emoji. And then there's three dots for more. The whole thing is, is there's what I would consider a major revision of the user interface. Yeah. Hmm. And Still whether or not image into the chat though that's that's unfortunate. Yeah. So um, and the other thing that happened yesterday, I can't remember if you were had your eyes and ears on, but Stacy had put in a URL, and I clicked on it, and when I clicked on it, the Zoom application died. I remember that. I remember and, you went away at that point. And I pondered whether that was because my computer was overloaded or whether there's a glitch in the new version of Zoom. And I really don't know which. Well, I clicked on that link and uh, nothing was out of the ordinary for me. So it came up for you. Okay. It's possible that I had, this This computer only has 12 gigs of RAM and it's an older operating system. So it's possible that I simply overloaded the local computer. And I, I didn't want to try it again in the middle of a session to, determine which was the case you could have checked uh memory utilization at that point that would have been interesting yeah i mean this is a a 2006 mac pro that was supposed to end with lion and i hacked it all the way up to el capitan which is still kind of obsolete and i finally have a late model client of zoom that still works on el capitan for a whole sec stretch of time there i couldn't update the zoom application because they had a group of them simply wouldn't run on el capitan and then with version 5.13 it began to run again now they're on 5.14 if i'm remembering the numbers yep okay well i but don't expect other people i don't know if stacy was planning to show up or not but 
very likely um, she will run into the same glitch and not be aware of it. Well, while we're waiting for Sam, since it's just you and me, you had referenced a request that I had made that you go back and view two videos. One was, I think, April 30th. And I think you did do that. I thought... watched the entirety of that one, I think, twice. And the one that was two weeks later, uh, I only found a request to do that, a request to go back and look at the previous one. I don't know that there was any one, anything else in that session besides the request to go back that you wanted me to review. Uh, and what did you observe? When I went back to the no, April 30th, um, I observed that you had gotten very, um, what's the right, what's the tactful word? Animated, shall I say? Okay. Don't, don't use tact, it's okay. Uh, you, you had um, become very heated. You were very heated in your ex uh, assertions and expressions uh, and had raised your voice. And I was startled, but also that triggers in me the, the loss of ability to focus because the, the emotional intensity basically uh, overrides the language processing for me first. Spoken language for me is really, really challenging because people talk faster than I can listen. Sometimes I can't get the phonemes because of accents or whatever issues. And, and if I turn on closed captions, I can sometimes get out of the closed captions what I'm not getting through auditory decoding. But when people are yelling, it's, it just compounds the problem. And we talked about that for, I don't know, something like 20 minutes or so. And you understood that the raising of the voice, um, intentional or otherwise, is basically disables the faculty of communication for me as a listener. I don't know if you remember way back when Stacy proposed I have a session with Colin and you, were, you and she were supposed to be in attendance and neither of you were there. And, and Colin talked at me in his fractured way of talking for I think six or seven hours. And towards the end, he said, listen, listen, listen. And I captured that one and I pulled it out and I put it up on Facebook, on, on uh, YouTube. And I said, this is what's wrong. I, this is, he yells at me to listen and he's not even talking in complete sentences. He's talking in, in um, uh, fra uh, word fragments, uh, uh, fra phrases that aren't sentences. So I don't, I can hear phonemes, but what did he say? <laughs> so the question was really, could you tell what got me so heated and animated? Um, maybe at the time I could have, but I certainly didn't write down a note to say what was the reason. Okay, so the answer is back and uh, review that. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing is, I see, I don't have a tape recorder up here. A lot of people can listen to a speech of a certain length, maybe five, 10, 15, 20 minutes or longer, and summarize it. Like these people who attend the, the political speeches and after the speech is over, they tell you what the guy said. I don't know how they do that. I would have to get the transcript written transcript, I have to read it slowly, carefully, and pick out the, you know, I have to highlight the six. I, I don't know how these people on, who do political journalism can do that. I can't. I don't have that faculty. And it runs in the family. It's not just me. I mean, nobody in my family could listen to articulated speech and then articulate back what they heard with any reliability. There's something there. It, it's a genetic thing because my parents didn't have it. My, nobody in my family could do what's called active listening. You know, active listening, where you, you say back to the person what you heard them say. If it's more than three sentences, it's gone. And I can't take notes fast enough to jot, to jot it down. And even if I did, I wouldn't be able to read my notes you know, five minutes later because they're chicken scratches, which is why I do reading and writing. I don't do oral communication because... Like I go to Toastmasters and after somebody gave a speech, if somebody said, Barry, can you summarize what Fred said in his speech? I said, no, I can't. I have no idea what he's talking about. I might've caught a word or two that I can recall. So by the way, I did turn on captions, but I'm not seeing them. Are you seeing them? Let me just see if uh, show captions. Uh, yeah. Um, 
you have to click on the button they say closed caption you have to click it one time yeah in fact you know i can't even show that anymore because it says hide caption i don't even have show as an option huh they it's, must they maybe they're off your screen someplace i'm getting them yeah it's good i'm getting them on the bottom bottom right above the yeah, you can move it you can move it around i go move it to some place where it does. maximize your screen maximize your your, your zoom screen Okay, I'm talking and I see no text. I see no. Text. Now let me, let me see if I let me see if a screenshot works here. I don't think screenshot always. I can works. do a screenshot, but the trouble is you cannot send the screenshot because it doesn't allow to send. I I can send screenshot, I guess, through the messenger, not the right. Um. So file. You is... said that uh, Zoom had updated this last week or so. I might. Yeah, have... I don't know exact date, but I do know that I have updated my Zoom application on every machine I have that I use it on. And it went from 5.13 to 5.14, I think within the last week or two. Anyway, I had that problem where you guys couldn't join earlier that cost us 12 minutes. And now I can't see captions. If there yeah, was an update, I'm sending you the caption screenshot, yeah. Um, can, if you have your uh, iPhone or whatever your mobile is, does your mobile show it? Yeah, or is it question. only on your on your uh, desktop? Mobile dot. <laughs> Not mobile. It it could be that this new version, this five point fourteen version, has got glitches in it that haven't been sorted out. Let's see. How do I get the? Uh... Anyway, we're wasting time here. But sorry, but I'm just noticing that. That's Let me look at preferences and see if just confirm um, general. Oh no, it's update. I think check for updates. Let's see what check for update says. I am running five point fourteen point seven. Morning in progress. Five point fourteen point seven is the version that I installed within the last week on this machine. Do you, do you know how to, you know how to um, check your version number? Help about. Yeah, it, right, it, right, it, but, but, but. It's different. I can see transcripts on my phone. That's all I wanted to verify. You so can. yes, I see transcripts there, but I'm not seeing it here on this main screen. Did you try toggling it a few times? Hide and show, hide and show. I will check my actual Zoom version here. Yeah, my is a 514.8. Dot eight? Dot eight, yeah, I'm- Oh, because didn't I just say I was running dot seven? I am I just was here, you, I wanna to prove to you that I have dot eight. <laughs> Hang on a second. I mean, I thought I said dot seven. I'm already one dot behind again? Again, of course. <laughs> I just installed this. Where, where is the check for updates? Unless you religiously like me, every time you use it, you check the updates. So it's crazy. Oh, check... oh, oh, I'm on a Macintosh. It updated on the 20th, which was yesterday. I'm on a Macintosh. And on the Macintosh, it says I'm up to date. So okay. the 5 .14 you must be on zero. Windows. Yeah, because, Windows. Yeah. Because, um, because I'm up to date on Mac. They're not, they, they don't, they have to fix them on one platform and not the other. Got it. So Windows had a glitch that they fix, and Macintosh either hasn't been fixed or doesn't have a glitch. Got it. Yeah. So you are you are you are up to date. I'm up to date on Macintosh. Yeah. Let me see if I check again to see if there's a, yeah it's updated. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. The check for updates and the other thing is the user interface for that stuff yeah. is different between Mac and Windows, and I never remember how to find it on the <laughs> platform I use the least. <laughs> yeah. It, it's annoying that they have a different uh, user interface. Yeah. I want to go back and talk about the the listening thing that I want to share my experience with you, Barry. So hopefully you can benefit from it. Okay. The most impressive listener that I know in my life is the one I met in Brazil. We have a conference for United Religions Initiative. This lady... She's a meditator. She's a, you know, uh, belongs to one of organization that she white, white dress, white clothes. She was be able to listen to a speaker for an hour and a half, nonstop. 
line by line translate the thing <laughs> in Spanish. I am not kidding you. I swear to God, I'll tell you, I couldn't believe my own eye. No notes. All she does is listen. And then she was able to speak up. I was like, man, I even have 1% of what you can do. I'm good, man. So that's the most impressive listener I ever have. So I believe that she has shut down all the distraction, all the thing, just tape recorder function is all she does. That she has built that brain path that they can do that since she was very young or something. I never met a second person that could, the other person I met is about 15 minutes that's, that she can do it. That's both of them are ladies. 15 minutes is listen to you word by word. I'm accurately transcribed translated all that so anyway for my perspective is i always look for the big picture i'm looking for pattern recognition so i'm a terrible secretary to record what's happening in the meeting i i always deny that job somebody wants me to become the the secretary as i i'm the most terrible secretary you're going to find but i'm the good executive i can make decision i can see the pattern i can see what the blind spot is i can see all that but i lost all the details in between i'll tell you a funny story I think maybe 30 or 40 years ago, I began to realize that I had a listening disability. I realized enough to, re to report it, to, to candidly admit it. And so I would tell people, I have a listening disability, runs in the family. My father can listen for about five minutes. I, I can listen a little longer than my father, but not much. But keep in mind, I have a listening disability. And no sooner do I tell them that, than they go on and they say, Barry, you're not listening. <laughs> I go, I just told you I have a listening disability. Weren't you listening? <laughs> so so uh, Thursday in, in uh, Toastmasters, one of the speakers uh, told an anecdote uh, about his wife saying to, to him, Kevin, he, she says, you're not listening. <laughs> and here's, this is a guy who's really, really good at oral communication. He's one of the best in Toastmasters at oral right. communication. And he tells a, a story about his wife complaining he's a terrible listener. Bless my heart. That's why I put the tape, the v YouTube video about the brain's perception deception thing. And um, it's a one hour. I told on my masterminds class yesterday, you guys have to watch it. That's how you know unreliable your brain is. Yeah. <laughs> how you understand it. Yeah. So, and so what I found out in this Toastmasters talk is that, yes, I have a known listening disability, runs in the family, and I tell people it so that they'll be aware of it. And then here's somebody. And, and when he said that story, every, almost everybody in the room nodded, you know, understandingly that, well, it's not just me, you know, that everybody who presumably has normal listening faculties, people complain they're not listening. Yeah. So... And that's why I basically switched to written communication because you can read at whatever slow speed you have to. But then the other problem is I use an English dictionary vocabulary word that's not in their working vocabulary. And they come across a sentence and here's a word and they don't know what the damn word means. And they basically throw away that sentence. How would I know? Yeah. I, can I, do I have to write at fifth grade level? I don't know how to write at fifth grade level. But the army manuals, the army instruction manuals are all intentionally written at fifth grade level. And they have expert editors who know how to down translate everything from the original version of the manual to fifth grade reading level so that the, so that the uh, people in the army can read the instruction manual and at least recognize every word and parse every sentence, whether they understand it, <laughs> but at least it's not using uh, 25 cent words that a college uh, graduate would recognize. And, and I run into this trouble. I mean, I'm not the only one who runs into this trouble. You think you've communicated. What you, what you articulated was a complete sentence, subject, predicate, grammatically correct, syntactically correct. All the words are correctly spelled and are in the dictionary. And still, There, there is a loss of translation from written language to verbal language. Let me tell, let me admit to you that my vocabulary is probably 80% of what your vocabulary is. So anytime you use a large word, I have to try to listen carefully and try to understand it with the content instead of know the word because the word that you use is way beyond my vocabulary capacity. So just let you know that.
Sam, who was that uh, Israeli fellow who was come to our sessions who says, listen for the energy, listen for the emotion, forget the words? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about, Sam? You got like, Sam Hahn. You know yeah. what I'm talking about? Is it yeah. Dahl? Was it yeah, Tal ta or Dahl? Tal. Tal, I think his name is. Yeah. There's this Israeli fellow who doesn't come off of me, but he's very insightful. Uh, and one of Gertrude, I think it was in one of Gertrude session. Is it Tal Avinash? Is that his name? Is it Dov Tal? Dov, Dov Tal, that's it. Dov, Dov, thank you. Dov Tal says, don't try to listen for the, the semantics of the words. Listen for the emotional intensity. Listen for the tone of voices, the energy, um, the facial expressions. And I go, but there's no meaning in those for me. I don't know what they mean. Because you don't have the, how do I say this? You don't have the senses, you don't have the parameter, you don't have the instrument or whatever that to receive that. Because your FM radio is on 88.5 and they start podcasting in 88.7 or something. <laughs> it's up. Yeah. I mean, I mean, when I do gestures, I try to be aware that I'm doing a hand gesture or facial expression right. that is in the everyday recognizable domain. Yeah. But other people have these micro expressions that are so arcane, so idiosyncratic, so obscure that except for a keen observer, yeah, like a psychologist who's very good at reading body language, who's an expert, right. at, most people will not recognize and decode the nonverbal, the body language, the facial expressions, the micro expressions, the slightly raised eyebrow, whatever. And you can learn to do that. First of all, you have to have really good vision. So I'm nearsighted. So when I look at your face in the you know, half so, you know, partial size, I don't see very much detail. If I make it full screen for each speaker and I get up close and I'm paying attention to that and forgetting the words, I might catch a micro expression you know, that's significant. So like, was it yesterday, Sam, you put on that, what did you call it? The Schrodinger expression, the Schrodinger smirk. And by the way, Sam, I don't think you ever unpack the name of the two phases of the Schrodinger smirk. I did. You did. You did? <laughs> what were they? It was in reference to, I would actually explain what it is after I heard what you and Stacy were guessing. <clears throat> did Stacy guess it right? She had a guess. She had a guess. I don't think I even uh, ventured a guess. Did I venture a guess? I don't think so. Because I, you know, clearly it's like a little bit like Mona Lisa's smile. It was a very, very faint Mona Lisa-like smile. And I go, I don't know what that means. Could mean, I mean, the space of things it could mean is huge. Well, he, but just, oh, oh, you just, you put me on spotlight, didn't you? Yes. Okay. That, <laughs> so I'm spotlighted. Now, um, people who are very good at reading facial expressions, we had a psychologist who worked where I worked at Bell Labs. And she said to me, she says, Barry, she says, I'm very good at reading facial expressions and body language. She says, Barry, I can't read you at all. I don't have a clue what, what your, aff he, she didn't use the word affective state, but that's what she meant. She says, I don't know, I have a clue what cognitive emotive state you're in by looking at you. And I remembered that disclosure for years before I finally realized, oh, I have to tell people that I'm vexed and perplexed. I'm trying to, I'm like an anthropologist from Mars, trying to decode these human signals and I'm vexed and perplexed, but the vexed and perplexed doesn't appear on my face. And here's the irony. When she says, I can't read you, she was in a state of perfect empathy. She was also perplexed because she couldn't read me because I wasn't transmitting anything that she recognized. And I was vexed and perplexed because people are transmitting all this stuff that I don't know what the hell it means. <laughs> so she was in empathy with me and didn't realize it. And it took me decades to solve that mystery. Go ahead, Sam, you put your two fingers uh, up. Zion needs to talk to me for a second. I'll be right back. Okay. So I was going to share with you about when I go to a Chinese restaurant, most of the Chinese restaurants are run by people from Hong Kong because they are good chef, good food. So I have a lot of time, I have my friends that speak Mandarin, the Chinese Mandarin, try to do ordering. And they can explain the hell out of it and take five minutes to try to explain something. 
I just smiled. And then when they finished, the waiter or waitress still, still couldn't get what the heck they're trying to order or whatever. And all I do is smile and I can speak in the land like, because my wife is from Hong Kong and she speaks Cantonese. I learned Cantonese when I'm in US. All I need is speak a couple of words and she got it right away. So, so you the, translated from one dialect that the your friends were speaking, which the eight, which the waitress didn't recognize the dialect. They recognize the dialect. They can understand the dialect. They can recognize the dialect. They understand the dialect. But then the dialect, think of this way, the dialect only gave her the understanding, but not the full depth of the meaning. She says, oh, you're, you're speaking, it's like a southerner in America. Oh, you're speaking a southern dialect. That's I right. Tell you're speaking southern dialect, but I don't know what your words mean because I don't actually know the meaning of the words you're using. Yeah, think of the southerner talking to you like, I ain't happy about what you're not doing to me or whatever, something double negative, triple negative thing, right? Right. And you, I couldn't you, fail to disagree less. That's right. <laughs> so that kind of language communication and going on for like 10 minutes or 15 minutes or try to order something. And I just smile. I just say two words. And then she got it right away. The waitress will get it. It happens so many times. The reason I observed that is I think of it's, it's a survival thing. It's an evolution survival thing. Because if you have people from your tribe, their micro expression can be easily recognized. But if you're not a different, my, not my tribe, your micro expression doesn't mean anything to me. Just fly by me. Exactly. Have you ever heard a southern, a southerner, a southerner in America say, "Bless your heart." <laughs> you know what "bless your heart" means for a It means you're full of shit. <laughs> I, well, I'm, I'm throwing away. You're you're just you're full just full of shit. I'm throwing everything. They say, "Oh, bless your heart." Yeah. That's what it means. Now. I had somebody had to disclose that to me. I wouldn't have known that. Yeah. Now I'll tell you another. Here's a word that I will be surprised if you know this word. It actually comes from the Hebrew, but it's still used in English. The word is shibboleth. Shibboleth. Shib. I'll write it down because shibboleth. S H I B B O L E. I'm not sure if the spelling is correct. Shibboleth. shibboleth. It might only have one B in it. Okay. Okay. Now, shibboleth is an idiosyncratic phrase or gesture that that only your tribe uses and knows. And the the whole idea is a shibboleth is something that you can recognize a member of your tribe and, without anybody else realizing it, and re recognize that somebody is not a member of your tribe. Got it. So shibboleth is this way to recognize something as idiosyncratic within a tribe right and an un unrecognizable yeah. by people outside of your tribe and if you lived in say in the middle east a thousand or two thousand years ago and you want to know can i trust this person can i confide in them the shibboleth was the way that you could recognize this person's a member of my tribe right not. right, right. Uh, and what, what you just said about uh that that's there's actually a word <laughs> yeah, that's word for that ability to recognize somebody who's using an expression that only is meaningful within your little enclave. Right, right. So what happened was there was a young lady that stayed in my house for like six months. She's part of the nonprofit organization. She's from England. So she's the one that tells me about Seb, whether you're in the upper class or lower class, I can hear you from whether you speak from your nose or not. <laughs> right. <laughs> Exactly. I, I mean, the very proper English they speak with, the, they don't move their teeth when they talk. <laughs> I, can't, I can't do impressions. That's a skill to do it. But people can do impressions of those distinctions in region or class or accent, right. whatever. And once you are very much aware of those distinctions, you can not only uh, imitate them, but you can recognize them. That's right. That's the right. average person you know wouldn't be able to recognize that and actors i was I was watching a video yesterday um, about an actress on star trek the famous star trek series and there's a character who is a very empathic character um deanna troy is a character in star trek and she's a betazoid she's not an earthling she's a betazoid and her ability initially was telepathy but they that was too weird so they got rid of that but she she's very she's very skilled at recognizing 
the the um, affective emotional state. She's very empathetic. That was her mm. one skill. The actress who played her, and they tried two different actresses to play this role of Deanna Troy. The one that they eventually, the first one they went with was an American actress. And, and Deanna Troy was supposed to have a, a kind of an exotic accent that wasn't obviously an American accent. And she couldn't pull it off. She she basically couldn't enact the character. Yes, so they are. Like, they so are. then they then they went with an actress named um, um, what's her name? I had her name and I just lost it. Uh, Cirrus, Mar Martina Cirrus. Anyway, this actress was a uh, born in in England, and so her her native accent was English was. British English. She still had a devil of a time not sounding like she's from Britain when she's trying to play the role of this Betazoid. And she really, really struggled, you know, with putting on this acting facade that didn't sound. And the other thing was that I think her, Amer her mother was American and her father was British. So she sort of, you know, was in this sort of had this, she called it a mid-Atlantic accent, half <laughs> British and half American. And she still had a devil of a time not sounding either British or American in this role. Mar Marina Sirtis is the actress's name. Mm. She played Deanna Troy. And all these actors who have to put on a character, they have to be very keen on a facade that matches the character and not their normal way and yeah that's a, that's a one hell of a skill yeah yeah i do know that for example grammar if you make a lot of grammar mistake people think that you're not as smart as you should be and then the vocabulary right and the way that you speak the word and the arrangement of words you know so like in malaysia like as i told you malaysia and filipino the word they have is the back is passive back pa i call it active passive right so it's not instead of like Fry banana is banana fry, you know? Yeah, it's like the Spanish. Uh, yeah, it's like the, Spanish where the, is a Spanish. Where, where the modifier goes after the noun. That's right, or, or that's right. Before it. Um, so, a, a good one um, for me is the word ask, A-S-K, ask. Uh, typically, urban Blacks would say ax, not ask, they'd say ax, A-K-S. You can. And so if you, you say, well, I asked him that, which sounds like he had chopped him with an ax. That was one of the uh, giveaways. Another giveaway was, uh, was if I get a, a, a soft drink beverage, do I call it soda or do I call it pop? Mm. In the Midwest, we had pop bottles. You know, and in the New York, it was soda. Mm. And those were sort of giveaways of the region that you live in, it's not the accent, it's the word you use. Right, that's what I say, grammar, words, vocabulary, right. arrangement of the words, the double negative. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the so, one that I'm having trouble with, and after 40 plus years of in America, I'm having problem with this, the word can or cannot. We, in, in, in the way we were trained was can, you know, so the cannot means can, it's can and can. Can't. I'm losing it already. Can C A N T. C A N T versus C A N T. I'm I'm having a hell of a time. I'm going to tell the judge that I cannot tell the difference between can and can. So leave me alone. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. I didn't notice this, but when I was putting up my uh, transcripts of my conversations with Chat GPT, yeah, one of them said it never uses contractions. It never says can't. It only says cannot. Yeah doesn't say uh, won't, it says will not. And it says, oh, I didn't notice that, but you're right. It doesn't use contractions. I will, not I'll. And, yeah. and I, I confirmed that, yes, they, they gave it. And I asked, so I asked ChatGPT, were you given express grammar guidelines to not use contractions and to only spell out cannot, will not? And it says, yes. I, I was instructed by my developers not to use contractions. And there's the reason why. 
because they, I'm having a hell of a time. If you have a lot of contraction in the sentences, I totally lose it. Right. And and somebody pointed, somebody actually wrote a whole article. Naomi Klein wrote an article about um, this is not uninteresting. <laughs> it's, called contraction, it's called contraction when you see the word can. Yeah, me making a note by myself. Contraction. So if, I, if somebody says, well, I'm not unable to do that. If I say I'm not unable, what does it mean? No, not unable. Unable <laughs> means I am able. <laughs> yeah. So, and, 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 and there are cases where not unable doesn't mean I'm very able. I'm just sort of, you know, neutral. Mm. I'm not good at it. I just, you know, it's, it's not a skill, um, but it's not that I can't. Wow, so, thank you. This is you, important to me. Yeah. So you so so when you say not on this, you know, yeah. you don't mean that I'm the opposite, don't mean I'm very able. It just means mm -hmm. I'm, you know, barely, you know, at the neutral where I'm not totally incompetent. Right. <laughs> not incompetent, but it doesn't mean I'm competent. Right. You know what? Then, the, it's there's a lot of this kind of language in Buddhist Sutra, lots of those kind of language. As well as the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching has many. This is, I would say, the most important grammars, whatever you call that. The, the way that they syntax it, the way that they write it is not unable, not, not, uh, not disappear, <laughs> appear, right. not disappear. That kind of language is driving me crazy. It's, it's, it's very ambiguous. Yes. And, it, and probably intentionally so. Yes, it is definitely intentionally. There, in, in the Greek literature, there are the Greek oracles, the prophecies of the oracles. Right. The oracles would, would give you a very cryptically worded sentence that right. was carefully constructed to be ambiguous. That's right. So when you read it, you could interpret it the way you wanted and not realize that it could also be interpreted the opposite way. Yeah, I know about that because a lot of times when you try to argue with someone, you always construct your sentence so that you cannot be saying wrong. No way they can say it wrong. So definitely you're gonna win. So when you by, by ambiguous, you're preventing people from saying you're wrong. Yeah. A friend of mine said a comeback that he used a lot with people who made an assertion that that he didn't agree with, he would say, Well, that's interesting. That's interesting means. That's baloney. That's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I know about the interesting part. <laughs> that's interesting means I, I'm not buying it. But he doesn't say that's a that's a you know that's horse dookie. Yeah. He says, well, that's interesting. And and diplomats learn to use these phrases, like for example, with all due respect, Senator, <laughs> how much respect that much. <laughs> that's right. With all due yeah. respect. They say, well, how much, you know, give me a metric. How much respect is due? Oh, zero. <laughs> so, but all due, so they learn these little expressions, which are criticisms that don't sound like criticisms. That's right. You know, one of my favorite one is says, you know how someone stands in the doorway and you want them to move. In America, they say, excuse me. In, if somebody say that in British, I have no idea to verify that. Could you please move your carcass? <laughs> <laughs> carcass yeah the carcass is your physical body yeah uh the on a vehicle it's the chassis the chassis. chassis is the physical thing and carcass literally is the physical body i thought it's a dead body no no carcass is not dead body uh, a cadaver is a dead body cadaver is a dead body a cadaver is a dead body a carcass could be living or dead but usually it's used to mean you know Good to see you're back. Let's see if Barry's back. You know, um, and when Barry's back, I'll explain what happened to the best of my ability. You know, certain credit cards, maybe I'll just explain it now. Certain credit cards, rather than using the actual number, they'll give you a special card number that you can use instead of revealing your uh, your main number, right? So I used one of those. By the way, you're on mute, Sam. So I used one of those uh, special credit card numbers yeah. rather than divulge my actual credit card when I signed up for Zoom. 
Now, mm -hmm. evidently, these special credit card numbers expire after some time. No, okay. actually, only some of them is only one time use. Oh, okay. Uh, maybe I, okay. So I had paid for it a year ago. Yeah. It couldn't be used for this uh, renewal. That was the problem. Yeah. So that one year, one time why, use. That explains import. why it had a passcode because you were using a free account. But here's the thing if you're using a free account, why did you have the features? Do you have all the features that you normally would pay for down at the bottom? Uh, let me show captions and see if that works now. Okay, now captions work for me. <laughs> That's odd because I'm using a free account and I got to see your captions. So I was able to turn it on. You saw it, but I didn't. That's I odd. There are, there are uh, extra features for the paid uh, subscribers of Zoom. I don't ever see them because I have the free account. I don't have the paid account. But at the bottom, that long list of thingies, you get extra ones uh, for being a paid account that should be missing now, if you remember what any of them are. Well, I just uh, made sure that I paid. So I just uh, committed, confirmed that the payment did go through. And yeah, when but... I returned to the session, it said you still are using a basic account. Yeah, because I look at the green shield and it still ha actually has the same password. It didn't change the password, H-U-E-9-W-Z. Um, anyway, I just want to explain uh, because I'm not a deadbeat, but I uh, just didn't realize that the- Are you sure? <laughs> well, at least we diagnosed- a, I'll be very clear about that. I used to be a deadbeat. <laughs> at least we so, correctly so diagnosed- my credit score at least 200 points in the last year and a half. Wow. Yeah. The, the good news, Sam, is that between the three of us, we correctly diagnosed the cause of the glitch. That's right. But it took, look, it took us an hour to recognize that there was a glitch, figure out how to get around the glitch, and then find out why there was a glitch. That's, Remember, we tried to fix the board while we we're in the sale mode. Right. And that's an example of model-based reasoning, systems thinking, diagnostic reasoning, which three of us who are supposedly pretty good at it still took a friggin' hour. <laughs> you know, to solve the mystery. Well, it took a symptom to renew our interest in solving the problem. <laughs> the well, it, it, the it, said your, it said your free account or your free session has ended. When, yeah. when, it clo when it closed, it said your free, I go, free session? Sam, Sam has a paid account. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a one for six or seven years, maybe longer, you know, and I didn't realize that, that my one-time use of this temporary credit card number was a problem. Yeah, don't mess around with that. Those things is, yeah. Anyway, so and back this, to business. This, this kind of issue comes up in all walks of life, yep. all the time. And people like me who specialize in model-based reasoning and diagnostic reasoning in domains where we have some depth can usually figure things out, if not in real time, within a day or two or maybe a week. Hmm. And even within model-based reasoning, in fact, even at the company and, you know, my own experience, I was somewhere around a third to a half of the issues that I waste time on are things like logins and permissions and accounts and authorization and, you know, secrets and, you know, tokens and passwords and, you know, oh, that's such, I mean, it's necessary in the enterprise world, but that takes so much time to get right. And okay. these things expire. Here's what happens at Toastmasters. The meetings are held in person in the Lexington Community Center. Oh, wait. When you, you, when you use the Wi-Fi in the Lexington Community Center, you have to uh, consent to the terms of service. And so it brings up a page in the Lexington Community Center where you have to click consent. But the website, the Lexington Community Center, allowed to expire their site, uh, what's it called, the site... Uh, Verification, what's that thing they call it? You know what I'm talking about? Um, SSL certificate. Yeah, there's a site. Yeah, there's a site cert certificate, certificate that, yeah. says that says that the website is certified to be what they claim to be. Yeah, it's then you get a they great let it expire. Now, right. Yeah. Because they let it expire, if you have an old computer, old laptop with an old operating system, it doesn't care. That's right. If you have an intermediate one, it cares, yeah. but it tells you the certificate has expired. Click if you want to proceed. That's so right. The latest version of Mac OS 
That's right. Doesn't even tell you. Says forget it. Yeah. You yeah. got a you got a, a bad site certificate. Yeah. You're screwed, and it doesn't even tell you you're screwed. It just doesn't yeah. work. It depends on browser, Barry. It depends on browser. Certain browser allow you to do it, like Firefox allow you to. The Chrome doesn't allow you to. So, so certain browser allow you to get away with it. Some certain browser don't even. It says it's unsafe. Therefore, you you're not going. One guy came in at the last minute to the meeting, two minutes before the meeting started. He has a brand new Macintosh. He can't get on the Wi-Fi. I try Safari. I try Chrome. I try Firefox. I try every browser on his system, and I can't figure out how to get to the page. It's, it's, it basically says that page is inaccessible. Yep. It doesn't say because it doesn't have a valid site certificate. Yeah. And it doesn't give me, I'm, I'm sitting there spending five minutes as the meeting is getting underway. And I'm supposed to be running the cameras for the <laughs> hybrid meeting. And I can't diagnose it because yeah. he's got the latest model uh, operating system on the latest model Mac that yeah. basically says we are super secure. And yeah. I'm not going to let you do anything that's slightly dangerous. I'm not even going right. to tell you that I'm not going to let you. That's right. And it took me a week to figure out, oh, that damn site certificate's expired. I thought I told them to fix it. Yeah. I told yeah. the community center IT people three times, update your site sec security because people are coming in with their laptops and they can't they can't um, consent uh, to your terms. Yeah. No, they won't fix it. Or the, not they won't, they haven't. They haven't. Yeah, it's, it's very complicated. To fix it, it's like several hundred dollars. And you're gonna do the the token thing. It, it, IT person asked me to do that. It takes me about three to five hours. I, I mean, when the first time it happened, you know, um, last summer, and we went through the okay, the site certificate's invalid. We got to find the little tiny thing where you can click to bypass it, and it's different on everybody's computer. And now, it's still and, and every month, every month, the the authorization has to be renewed not the authorization yeah. your your laptop will only let you bypass it for a month yeah and then and then you got to re-up the consent thingy the consent expires right, right. so every so every month and in the middle of the month they go nobody can get on the damn wi-fi and we have to waste you know five or ten minutes as i go around everybody's laptop and figure out where on your laptop on your browser is this hide, hidden little thing to bypass the, uh, you know, the security warning. Ah, it's it drives me crazy, and nobody else in Toastmasters is anywhere near the level of understanding to be able to handle it. Yep. Okay, yep. Barry. Yeah. Sam. Yeah. Permission to rant for ten seconds. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. You know this view button at the upper right. Yeah. View That's button upper like, right. Many times, so the one that dropped down to say speaker view, gallery view, hide self view, hide non video participants, stop incoming video, and full screen. Right. I click it, it pops up for like a millisecond and then disappears. Pops up for a millisecond. This, I have to click it like a dozen times for it to actually, you know, stay. And then I can select speaker view or gallery view or whatever. If you click and hold the button, does it still go away? Nothing happens. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, whether these are glitches in the new client or what the hell, these glitches turn up at haphazardly. And the first time a glitch turns up, you go, I, I've never seen this glitch before. <laughs> now I've got to spend, you know, a certain amount of time, you know, wrapping my brain around the symptom of the glitch, right. guessing where the glitch, who's responsible for the glitch, right. how to fix it or how to get around it. And poof. no. In the interest of transparency, I am using a, using a Linux version of Zoom. However, yeah, I've that's the problem had right problems there. With this before, yeah, or recently, I've never had previous problems with this before. What yeah. can you can you bring up the version number of Zoom that you're using on Linux? Yeah. 5.14.0. <laughs> and I'm using dot seven, and Sam is dot eight. Yeah. So you're yeah. using fourteen dot zero which means yeah. that whatever are the issues, if any, on the Linux version, they haven't been corrected. See, so you, so Zoom, so Sam has got eight corrections, eight, eight tiny little updates. I've got seven little updates on Mac OS. Yeah. You've got no updates on Linux for 5.14, but 5.14 yeah. had bugs in it. I understand that. But all I'm saying is even so, these problems didn't used to happen for me, even though I'm lagging your versions. Well, you were on 5.13 until recently. Yes. 
514 only came, 514 itself only came out within the last two or three or four weeks. And since it came out, it's gone through seven or eight tiny oh, revisions. So you're saying 514 has a well, standard, you know, stabilization blip where bugs come and they have to slowly. Right. You know, the, the fact that, that Sam Chan is on dot eight means there's probably one more bug that's also in the Macintosh version that they haven't identified or fixed yet. Or it may be only on Windows. Are you on Windows, Sam? I'm on Windows. Yeah, so certain bugs only appear on certain platforms, so you may yeah. not get it. it and certain operating systems of certain platforms, because like I say, I'm running El Capitan here, believe it or not. Anyway, I'm just saying it didn't used to happen. It's yeah. happened now, and there's been a number of things. This, uh, yeah, well. So, yeah. so next Thursday, when I go back to Toastmasters and do a hybrid meeting, very likely, we're going to have people in the room with different platforms, different operating systems, different versions of Zoom, and I'm going to have a myriad of glitches, none of which I'll be able to fix in zero time. Hey, this is All a right. modern Tower of Babel problem. It is. It is. Right? Yep. You can see how the Tower of, yeah. Tower of Babel sort of demolished society. Yeah. Well, I, I look at it from a different perspective. I look at it from when it's working, it's a miracle. Yes. It's a truly a miracle. It's a capability Sam, we didn't have a thousand years ago. Sam, yeah. quick, quick, uh, slight change of subject for just a minute. Did you get any messages that there's traffic on Mattermost? Uh, I have not been on Mattermost in weeks. Okay, I got an email alert on one of the one of the threads uh, that I did attend to, and you and we don't want this on recording, but at some point. Um, maybe offline or in Messenger, um, I will clue you in because we are at a um, an issue that has come up in the past that I don't want to put on. Okay, then tape. we can connect later. All right, thanks for the signal. Yeah, but but after the session is ends, hang, hang out with me for a second in Messenger. Okay. Anyway, sorry for the rant. Uh, I had problems yeah. on my own, but I think Zoom also has some problems. Anyway. On to the next thing. All right. But so, before I before I let you go, next thing, I just want to let you know that even though I have the latest version of point eight, doesn't mean I'm perfect. I still have a lot of bug yet to be discovered. <laughs> just to let you know that. That's a good prediction. There will be bugs <laughs> in the future because there are bugs <laughs> the nature of software. Job it, security. It, I call it job security for the software engineer. First they added new features. <laughs> Whenever they add new features and and 514 added a bunch of new features that I'd never seen before. And sure enough, there's bugs in the new features. Yeah. Oh, one of the things that I do like, I haven't used it yet in the chat, is you can now format bold and, and italics and whatever, you know. Mm. Or they now have this formatting thing, which now I have to learn to use if I want to learn to use it. Yeah. Oh, the, the main thing in chat is that a carriage return doesn't automatically send. Mm. You could have carriage returns in paragraphs, but right. then you got to click the little uh, send uh, arrow chevron thingy. Right. If you don't click the little send um, thing, it doesn't. Uh, a character return doesn't automatically send. That's yeah. that's important. I like that better because a lot of time I hit enter, don't mean to hit enter. It just means I want the next line that is sent for me instead. Right. Of... It used to be that if you did, uh, I think it was shift return, it wouldn't send. Right. Okay. But uh, who remember to do a shift return when they go to the next line? I do. That and some does that and some doesn't, and you never yeah. know which is which. Right. You can do that on Facebook also, by the way. This Facebook drives me crazy because between Messenger and Facebook and the original uh, post and the comments, they're all slightly different in that regard. Putting a blank line between paragraphs. Well, see, they're not they're not consistent at least the vendor can actually control what text object everything uses in yeah. linux since it's a wild woolly west you can use almost any text object yeah so i i'm it, as much as i try to stay on top of the functionality and the features they 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 don't work this consistently uh and and they change them on you without uh, fair warning. Okay, so I think we've lost momentum on our previous topic. What was I don't that? even remember what the previous topic was from before, <laughs> before the break. <laughs>
We were talking about shibboleth yeah. languages and the fact that spoken language and nonverbal signals that accompany spoken language are very easy to not get the message that the person is intentionally sending and getting messages that they're unintentionally sending that they don't mean to send. And, and I, as, as aware of that as I am, and as many fixes as I know for, like say the name of the word that identifies the emotional state that you want to disclose. And you were talking about being vexed and perplexed. Yes. Right. So it turned out today that um, I asked ChatGPT for a whole list of synonyms for being in a double bind. You know, double bind. You both know what double bind. So it gave me 10 words for being in a double bind, for a f 10 emotional words, and then putting them not in the list, but simply mentioning them in the, in the uh, surrounding paragraph. One more bewilderment. Did it use catch 22? I think it did. I'd have to go back and look. Yeah, between rock and hot place. <laughs> I don't think it did that one because these were single words. But the point is, is that beyond saying that I'm vexed and perplexed or bewildered or frustrated or confused or discombobulated, I mean, I have to stop and say, okay, which of these dozen vocabulary words must I write down correctly spelled so that the person has a chance of understanding. Go ahead, Sam. Okay. I liked one of your previous examples, which is AKS versus ASK. Right. Okay. Because it is not textbook grammar, right? Correct. But in the context, it could be much easier understood among the people who practice that particular dialect, right? Right. So if you're really interested in communicating, you wouldn't necessarily put it in theoretically perfect text, right? You'd want to use whatever could be most easily understood by the audience, right? Yeah. So face-to-face face, face -to -face in the street in downtown Manhattan or the Bronx or whatever, you would say ax. Right. But you wouldn't say it on Facebook unless you're in some group that's just your little tribal demographic group. Right. So I'm just trying to hook back to the point that... Um, this knowledge about communication, okay? There's knowledge, and then there's knowledge about how to communicate knowledge. Okay? Right, meta-knowledge. This knowledge about how to communicate knowledge is, in my opinion, more complex than the knowledge itself because you have to have a model of your audience. Yeah. Okay, you call it theory of mind. I call it mental model, okay? Yeah, same thing. And if you have a large group of people that you're trying to communicate with, now you have to have the understanding of the spectrum of different mental models that are out there maybe they, some of them live in europe stuff. some of them live in asia and right. you have no, some of them live in the philippines you have no idea right how to reach an audience that for which english is not their first language they live halfway around the freaking planet for exactly. which is why i think chat gpt and its ilk are so fascinating because they can take a perfectly formed transmission from you Okay, and they can translate it to a five year old, 11 year old, an 18 year old, a 35 year old, a 70 year old, right? It right. can do that given the same transmission from you. Whereas if you were trying to communicate with each of those five or 20 different types, you'd All have right. to spend different time and you'd have to have different skills, and it would take a long time for you to reach all of them. Yeah. Right? Here's, here's another That's fascinating Here's another trick I just learned. I should have known this trick for years, but I didn't. If you have an um, an image on Facebook or any actually any web page, but on Facebook in particular, somebody puts up an, a, an image, uh, and um, you want to find out the origin of the image or if it has text in the image, and the text you can't quite read it for whatever reason. If you click on if you right click on the image and you say, Google. Google I, it's now called Google I, they changed the name, Google I, Google I will bring up a sidebar where it puts a little thumbprint of the image and where it thinks it came from. But one of the things you can put in is you can click on uh, text and it will try to find the text in the image and it will try to uh, let you get a readable version of the text and copy it or translate it if it's in a different language. So mm -hmm. I have a, a correspondent who puts up images that have Spanish text in them. Yep. 
cartoons that have Spanish yeah, subtitles. When you travel overseas, you can actually have an app where you're looking at signs and it'll translate for you. Yeah. Oh. So so I will I when Oswaldo, whatever his last name is, puts up one of these Spanish language cartoons with a Spanish language uh, dialogue in it. I'll click on the Google Eye thing. I'll get it to get the text, and I'll get it to translate the text. And then, if I bother, I actually paste the English back in uh, as a comment because otherwise, I see these cartoons. And I go, "He's trying to send me some cartoon, but I don't get it." Yeah. Or Google Translate okay. can do that also, Barry. Google Translate on the what's iPhone. What's worse is that if the cartoon uses idiosyncratic Spanish, good luck. And cartoons will use idiosyncratic phrases, which are not standard Spanish, for example. Yeah. And, and I'll have to sort of interpret the, uh, the idiom. It'll use an idiom that uh, you have to sort of, but so I'll take that and I'll put that over into ChatGPT and get ChatGPT to unpack the idiom for me. But you know, I'm taking three, four minutes to parse a cartoon that if I were a native Spanish speaker, I wouldn't get in five seconds. So it's got to be worth the effort. So yeah, the faster way to do this is called if you have Microsoft Office. I mean, Microsoft Windows Ten or Windows Eleven. That's a tool you can download. It's called Power Toys. Microsoft Power Toys. It has a tool that you can just all you do is do now the the, the window key and then T for text, and you can just highlight that part of it. It will capture. You will grab the text off the picture any picture you want it's yeah see here faster. i am on 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 google chrome running on mac os el capitan in facebook All right I, and i gotta click on google i and then <laughs> i tell i to do the trend to to do image to tech ocr ocr right yeah and then and then copy the text and maybe translate it yeah and maybe ask jack chat gpt to explain what it even means in plain yeah. english so and i will do that um you know on some occasions but i can't do it on every occasion because it's just it's it's not worth it. you didn't i didn't get enough out of it <laughs> yeah and if somebody is is writing in very fractured english they're not writing they're full of typos and misspellings and homonyms where they said they have the word that sounds the same but it's a different word you know at some point i'll i'll say it's not worth it i can't have a conversation with this person it's just too much work you want to hear something Google's the translate on the facebook funny thing my friend in malaysia wrote in malay language the daughter's wedding i can understand the malay language and i click the button to say translate on the on the facebook Guess what? He translated the wedding into something else, another event. The event is called, what would that be? The bar funniest mitzvah. thing you can think of. Your, da your daughter's bat mitzvah. <laughs> I'm making a daughter's joke Daughter's date. <laughs> Funeral. Funeral? What? Yeah, what? I'm not Funeral? kidding you. What? I am not kidding you. He translated the Malay words of wedding. Like the center. Again, it's all about context. The context is a wedding context. And the word is the same word for both events. It's the same word for wedding Both, and funeral in Malaysia is the same word? Yeah, it's the same good, word. Good grief. So you have to decode it by context. Yes. That's Holy what I'm telling God. you. So I was like, I look at this, I show it to my daughter. It's like, what? People are congratulating on her daughter's funerals. Do you, you, do you know the story about LOL? <laughs> yeah, the story true. where a, a guy thought that LOL meant lots of love not laughing out loud and so he got a message that somebody had died and he responded and he finished it with lol not realizing that lol means means laughing out loud he thought it meant lots of love yeah he had no same, clue that he was same issue it. same issue that's a perfect thing like the word no way right the, yeah. unless you look at the context you cannot figure out what the heck it really means English is full of sarcasm where you say one thing and it means sort of the opposite. That's right. And when you're speaking something that's sarcastic, the tone of voice is a clue that it's being sarcastic. That's right. If it's in text, 
you can't be sure that they were it was said sarcastically. Yeah, because you don't have the modality for that. Right. It, you don't you don't have the inflection. Yeah. And inflection it carries a lot of meaning. So what are you gonna do about that? Well, I'll tell you what I did do about it. Because I went all the way back to the early 90s when all we had was plain text. We didn't have italics, we didn't have bold, we didn't have pictures, we just had, you know, plain text. And if we wanted to do a gesture, like scratch your head, I would have to type colon scratches his head. <laughs> and it would print molten scratches his head. That's called a that's called an emote. IRC. <laughs> yeah. And so we had these these things that you could have a speech actor would put quotes, molten says, sentence, or molten, and then it would be it would narrate a gesture. And you had to write down the actual narration. Molten looks confused, you know, colon looks confused. And you would learn to use these features of a speech act versus a nonverbal, and you had to learn the the vocabulary terms to narrate a gesture that would have been simply, you know, this, okay? <laughs> Molten rolls his eyes. Molten throws up his hands. Molten shrugs his shoulders. <laughs> Sam? They, often emojis are a designated colon, emoji name, colon. You know, yeah. in certain apps. And you have to know the name of the emoji. Yes. So, so somebody says- You have to spell somebody, it out precisely. Right, somebody says, what's the emoji for? And then they give you an approximate definition of what they want. And you got to go, what is the correct name of the emoji that they're referring to? What does it look like? So one is if I have the emoji image, what's its name? Or if I have the name, what's the emoji image that goes with the name? And this is a whole dictionary. There's hundreds of emojis which have names and, and, and uh, images. And you have to learn this whole other language. The and I'm, problem I'm, I'm having the problem I'm having is that the misinterpretation. For example, you say that like, Molden uh, looked confused. Are you sure he looked confused, or you are just thinking that he looked confused? Like the interpretation looked confused. So there's a confusing of the confused right there. It's like I, driving me crazy. I wanted to use the emoji for chagrin. I wanted to say, how do I look chagrin? Guess what? There's no emoji called chagrin. Yeah. I don't even know when it's close to what I don't know for sure what it should look like. <laughs> I just know that I can say I'm really chagrined about that. I'm sad. I'm embarrassed. Um, I'm a little angry. It's a sort of a melange of, of, oh, that's disappointing. It's a chagrin worthy event. Okay. And I like the word chagrin because it's a nice word that says an emotional state without, you know, being too intense. Damn it, there's no emoji for chagrin that I know of. Do you if, know you have great, if you have the great one, well, how would that logo look like? <laughs> well, that's the next question is because I can use the word. Yeah. Has a cartoonist ever shown Charlie Brown in a state of chagrin or Linus in a state of chagrin where the cartoon face is, oh, I get that. That's called chagrin. You don't have to use a cartoon. You can give like three or five examples of the picture that people look so green. Then you can create it from there as a baby step. Yeah. So if I say I'm bewildered, I'm chagrined, I'm confused, I'm perplexed. Good luck finding the emoji that I would use for those states. Barry, ask Dolly to do it. Hey, by the way, I'm getting this message again. The meeting will end in 10 minutes. I did okay. pay right at the time that this thing started. Yeah. Evidently, they have to update their database. Yeah. Um, so, so when when it ends, and it will end abruptly. Up in the up in the top, it tells you when it's going to end. Time left nine forty one nine thirty nine. Can you see that? Yeah. Next to the re re recording. I, I, need, I need to leave at nine thirty around anyway. Yeah. 9, Let's just call it uh, a day because. Um, We've had so many starts and fits and stumps and you know ranting and whatever. I'm not feeling as uh, as much fun as I had yesterday. I thought yesterday was a particularly fun session. I have to say again. Yeah. Um, oh, and that's what I want to talk to you about when we get off and talk to you. Just okay. not a recording. It's not so much in private. Just not a recording. Okay. Anyway, so I'll let you guys talk so I can. Yeah, I'm I'm complete today. Thank you so much. Yeah. Let's let's just 
say today was kind of a rant session, but uh, hopefully it'll be better next week. Yeah, at least you now know that when you start a session, you can determine whether or not it's a paid session or not. You know how to tell. Okay. Anyway, you should put them in the credit card and you're good. <laughs> I did. Okay, good. Thank you. I'll see you guys. Take care. Okay. Thanks, Sam. Bye -bye. Thanks Bye -bye. for joining. Bye-bye. Okay, let me turn off the recording here.